Okay, this video is Healthcare Conversations, and uh, it's for um, March uh, 2024. And so basically, I was at a social event, and I ran into some old doctor friends. And just to give you a little heads up, sort of these university doctors, one of the really good internists had said, you know, there's lots of good, really good doctors, but the two great ones are myself and this other guy, this internist. He's a real good-looking, tall guy, really smart, very nice. He's got a funny, with a good sense of humor. So anyways... I was talking to him a little bit, okay? And so I said to him, uh, you know, have you read these theories about a couple different diseases, okay? And he goes, uh, no, I haven't. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I've been busy. And I know that's bullshit because he's a real smart guy and he reads a lot of anything he's interested in. And I said, no, I don't believe that. I said, it's because you don't think these diseases are curable and you also think all these old patients are stupid, hopeless, and it's a waste of time to try to teach them and you don't get paid for it. Um, so you just don't, you're not interested. Okay. I go, that's learned helplessness. You've given up on these diseases and given up on these patients. And he just smiled. And then I said, you could hate me. And I'm, I said, but you know what? You're like a land animal. And compared to you, I'm like an eagle flying above. I can see so far ahead of you. You don't even realize it. And that the cause for these diseases is known. And there is a treatment that makes a difference. So he laughed and said, well, why don't you give grand rounds and come teach us? By the way, that was a bit of a joke because he's a really tall guy. And so I'm, I'm short of him. So for me to say I'm an eagle above him was kind of funny. Okay, so then uh, he said, why don't you give us a grand rounds and teach us? Why don't you publish a journal article on this? I said, I have never been invited, not once, by anyone from university, despite the fact lots of the doctors there know me and compliment me all the time. I said, never once have any of your doctors invited me to give grand rounds. And I said, I've tried to publish a lot of my ideas in the journals, and they won't publish my ideas like on neurodegeneration of the brain and the spine. I go, because I'm changing the paradigm. That is not popular to change a paradigm. They want somebody who just adds to the current paradigm. Um, and he says, well, the PhD researchers would love to hear from you. You'll help give them some ideas for their research. I just laughed. I said, lots of people have seen my internet videos. There's tons of doctors and PhDs who've seen my lectures on the internet. No one, not a single doctor or PhD ever invited me to speak. Actually, there have been two doctors. One doctor invited me to give a mini lecture and he freaked out when I contradicted all the textbooks on atherosclerosis and he wouldn't invite me again to anything bigger than that. That was too, for, for somebody who spent their whole life going by some out-of-date theory that's obviously wrong, it's uncomfortable for them to think they have to learn a whole new concept. Uh, they actually don't want it. Um, and then another one was an endocrinologist, a lady endocrinologist invited me to give some lectures and then she was t I should have just shut up and took in the invitation. But when I started talking some more, it was real obvious. I knew far more about diabetes and biochemistry than she did. And she kind of freaked out and she never followed up on it. So that was the only time any, oh, actually one neurology lady, I don't think she was a doctor, I think she was a PhD, she invited me, but she never sort of, she kept, you know, postponing and stuff. And finally, I'm like, I'm too busy. I can't, I can't deal with postponements and all these problems. So I just didn't follow up with her. Um, but anyways, I thought that was kind of funny. I, I don't expect I'll ever be invited to speak in front of MDs or PhDs. That's partly why I'm on the internet and I'll speak in front of people interested in nutrition. But anyways, um, let me just show you what I think is relevant to these conversations here. This is, um, you know, like... Dante, you know, and Dante's uh, Divine Comedy begins in the Inferno chapter where he says, in middle age, I found myself in a wood and the path was lost. And that's like lots of middle-aged people. All of a sudden, they've been healthy all through their 30s, then in their 40s or 50s, all of a sudden, they're fat, they're sick, they have some significant problem and they're scared. I had a guy, you know, a f friend from Stanford who flew all the way to talk to me personally because he couldn't get the truth from his... Uh, his doctors, and even though he's at the Ivy League hospitals. Okay, so anyways, why I'm telling you this is, this is a very common situation. In middle age, I found myself in a dark wood and I was lost. Okay, and so here is Virgil, you know, Dante's hero and his guide, the great poet uh, from the Roman days who wrote the Aeneid. Okay, so anyways, they come to the gates of hell, and the sign on the door at the gates of hell says, Abandon hope, all ye who enter. And that kind of reminds me of conventional medicine. They basically tell all of the patients with chronic disease, you could never be cured. Abandon hope. You will never be cured. And it kind of reminded me of this diagram here. You know, basically, if you go down the conventional path, you know, eating the junk food and doing all the stuff that regular people do, you end up on drug, drug, drug. Then you go for surgery, chop, 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 bye-bye money. You're poor, you're broke, and you're prematurely dead. Okay, so on the other hand, you go low-fat, low-sodium, vegan, avoid the toxins, the other things that can make you sick, you know, get your act together. You're probably going to keep the Johnson working a lot long, not need any pills, and no surgery, or certainly less pills. 
and you'll live a lot longer. Average time of death, be, you know, getting up close to around 90. And so it reminded me of the Robert Frost poem, Two Woods Diverged in a Wooden Eye. I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Okay, so that's the first conversation. Okay, um, here's the next one. A healthcare worker I was talking to, um, and he asked me, he goes, how come insurance companies don't give us, you know, a significant discount for being healthy and for eating healthy? And I said, because they don't have to. I mean, they get more money. They make their money off the healthy people, and then they lose money on the real sick people. Um, and he said, well, but they could save money if they motivated us to be healthy. And I go, I'll bet they thought of it, but it must not be profitable. And he said, I think there's more to it. I think they don't care about us. I go, well, it's a business, you know. And then I thought some more about it, and I said, gee, it does seem weird that the insurance companies won't pay doctors to teach the patients about the vegan diet. Okay, I know Ornish is working on some things like this and stuff, but in general, they don't get paid for any type of teaching patients. That's why they don't want to do it, okay? And it also might be because typically what dietitians and doctors are trained in is Mediterranean diet, which is a joke. It doesn't work, okay? It's a lousy diet. Um, and maybe the insurance companies make more money if they get everybody, keep everybody sick, because then they get big payments. You need to have pay big premiums if you're going to go for big expensive stuff like stents, usually billed for about thirty thousand dollars. You know, cabbage for hundred coronary artery bypass grafts, open heart surgery for coronary artery disease. You know, about one hundred twenty thousand or more, everything all included. So you know what? You're going to go to some fat camp where they teach you they're only going to bill you, you know, maybe one thousand, two thousand at the most or something or or less. So anyways, everybody blames Big Pharma, but it, it almost seems like insurance companies are working with them to keep the system exactly as it is, almost always centered around drugs. Just thought that was a little bit interesting.